Welcome. Today we're going to talk about tobacco. Uh, I like to give a disclaimer on the tobacco lecture, and that is, um, I think it's terrible. And that is, and the reason I say that is because with most drugs, I can say, okay, there's pros, there's cons, moderate use is okay, maybe okay-ish, and this and that. Smoking cigarettes is just horrible in my opinion. Um, and my opinion is based on research and facts. So I do like to give that disclaimer. If you are someone who smokes cigarettes, I apologize if I am rude. Mm. But hopefully we're just going to learn some facts today. So that shouldn't be a problem. Let's, let's get going here. All right. So tobacco, it is a legal product. It is used by a lot of people, adults primarily, okay? It is also a substance that is responsible for more adverse health consequences and death than any other drug. And as a matter of fact, if you combine all the drugs, all the other drugs, and combine how many people they have killed within a year, all together, smoking cigarettes, tobacco use, kills more people each year than all the other drugs combined. Okay. Now tobacco, okay? Tobacco was cultivated and used by Native Americans for centuries. Um, they presented tobacco leaves as a gift to Columbus in 1492. The word tobacco was adopted by the Spanish. They have some ideas, but probably from the Arabic word tabac, meaning medicinal herbs. Now, early medical uses, okay? In the 1500s, there was recognition of me medical potential. Um, the French, French physician, Jean Nicot, hence nicotine, was a really early proponent of this. Okay, so nicotine is the active ingredient in cigarettes. If you want to know that, nicotine is the active ingredient in um, cigarettes. Some people don't know that. Um, the nicotania is the plant genus that was named after this French physician. Okay. Now, in the 16th and 17th centuries, tobacco was really viewed as having these positive medical uses, uh, but they did start to notice that it was having a negative reproductive effect. So even in the 16th and 17th centuries, people started noticing some negative physical consequences. Now, in the 1890s, um, Nicotine dropped from the U.S. pharmacopoeia, and that means that it was no longer considered a medical use product. Okay. Now, when we talk about tobacco, there are really two major species that are grown today. Okay. There are a lot of species, but these are our two main ones. We have our Nicotania tobaccum. This is our large leaf species. It's indigenous only to South America. However, it's cultivated widely. And then we have our Nicotania rustica. These are more of our small leaf species. It's from the West Indies and Eastern North America. Okay. Um, let's see. So there's a lot of different types of tobacco products. And again, I'll be clear that all of these are harmful in different kinds of ways. Snuff, hmm. 18th century, snuff, snuff use became really as widespread as smoking decreased. Um, I say as widespread, I mean, so actually snuff became more popular as smoking became less popular. However, in the US, it was perceived as a British product. So. Some drug use changed during the American Revolution, and that was that some things became popular in Britain, you know, within the British groups. And then if it was popular 
in England, then it became less popular in America. If it was popular in America, it became more popular in England. So we have this with snuff, and we'll also see this when we talk about caffeine and tea versus coffee. Okay, so as the American Revolution happened, snuff really became much less popular here in the U.S. Chewing tobacco. The 19th century, most tobacco used in the U.S. was actually chewing tobacco. Um, and smoking didn't surpass the chewing tobacco use until the 1920s. Okay, um, if you're not familiar with chewing tobacco, it tends to be something that people will put um, in their mouths uh, between their lip and their teeth, say it that way, um, and they kind of hang on it and they spit. So you have to be spitting continuously, which is not the most attractive thing that people can do. But remember, people are addicted to these things. You also have these dangers, of course, of where you're holding that chewing tobacco, having cancers there. Um, if you want to look up pictures of things to motivate you to stop, look up pictures of people that have had mouth cancers due to chewing tobacco. It's can be pretty graphic. Okay, cigars. So cigars are actually a combination of chewing tobacco and smoking tobacco. You're not supposed to inhale cigar smoke. Um, it will make you sick. Kids often don't know this. Kids shouldn't be smoking cigars anyway, but sometimes that's how they learn. Um, it, cigars really peaked in popularity, popularity in the 1920s. Um, cigars are one of those connoisseur type of products where they have lots of different styles and flavors and from here or from there. And they can be really expensive. Now cigarettes. Native Americans actually used to use these thin reeds and then they'd feed, fill those thin reeds with tobacco and smoke that. However, you know, mass production here in the U.S. In the 19th century, factories started to appear. So before that, you know, people rolled their own cigarettes and then factories appeared and you had this mass production of cigarettes and then the cost goes down, of course. <clears throat> so the habit, habit spread widely with the advent of inexpensive machine produced cigarettes. And smoking cigarettes is the most popular form of tobacco use currently. Now, we have our little product milestones here. In 1913, the camels had low-priced domestic tobacco. In 1939, Paul Mall came out with their king-size cigarettes. And in 1954, Winston came out with filter cigarettes. Okay, the filter is somewhat helpful. Okay, both cigarettes now are filter cigarettes. Um, it's still very dangerous. Okay, so tobacco started to have some problems throughout time. Of course, it's still a very widespread epidemic, if you will. 1604, King James of England published an anti-tobacco pamphlet. 1604, harmful to the brain dangerous to the lungs. Like, they knew that then. Hmm. However, let's be clear, England also supported the American tobacco trade because there is so much money in this. 1908, New York made it illegal for a woman to use tobacco in public. The idea was this was a way to protect women from themselves. I, of course, don't care for laws that affect women differently than men. However, they actually made a law at the time that would have saved so many women. Okay, the 1930s and 40s, reports linking smoking and cancer. In the 1930s and 40s, there were reports linking to smoking and cancer. And the reason that I say these dates over and over again is not because I need you to memorize them, but to point out, this was a long time ago. In 1952, Reader's Digest had an article out that was 
Cancer by the Carton. Oh my gosh, 1952. Tobacco company's response said, uh, we don't know what they're talking about. The formation of the Council for Tobacco Research came about. Uh, let's be real clear, not independent. This is not a, you know, research group that is unbiased. Um, they really just tried to undermine the health risk claims. Mass marketing of filter cigarettes and cigarettes with lower tar and nicotine content came out. So the idea was this is a safer alternative. What they actually find is that when people smoke lower tar, lower nicotine content cigarettes, they actually just end up smoking more. Some people don't. And that's good, but not great. And often people just start to inhale deeper and smoke more. In 1964, a Surgeon General, this is the first Surgeon General's report that came out that said, smoking causes lung cancer in men. Not linked to, but causes. You know I don't jump to causes very quickly. I'm a correlation person. But this said, this is what's happening. Tobacco sales at that point began to decline. The decline has continued for about 40 years. However, I do want to say that although the Surgeon General report came out in 1964, medical journals, medical journals still had advertisements in them for cigarettes. Um, medical, the um, American Medical Association came out and said, Oh, uh, well, you know, we're not so sure about that, even though they know. Um, it's amazing what money can get people to say. 1965, Congress required warning labels on cigarette packages. 1971, radio and TV banned cigarette ads. In 1990, smoking was banned on interstate buses and domestic airline flights. So most of you probably don't remember this, and I mean, honestly, I don't really because my family didn't have that much money to be flying on airlines. Um, but before 1990, on airline, an airplane, if you imagine an airplane in your head, you had a smoking section, a smoking section. Like, I think if somebody is sitting anywhere on an airplane and somebody coughs, you're probably going to get sick. This was smoking sections on airplanes and non-smoking sections. Pretty, pretty awesome. Also on buses, same thing, smoking sections on buses. 1995, the FDA proposed fur further regulation of tobacco and ads. Many additional states and local towns passed bans, okay? So there's a lot of bans, and I understand that people have different feelings about these things because I do understand the feeling of having personal freedoms taken away, uh, and I know that that can be really upsetting for people. Um, however, we do see that secondhand smoke is extremely dangerous to people. We do see that thirdhand smoke is extremely dangerous to people. Secondhand smoke is the smoke that comes off the end of your cigarette and that other people breathe in. So the, the part of the cigarette that you have in your mouth has a filter on it. The opposite side of the cigarette does not have a filter on it. And so more carcinogens are actually released from there and put out into the air. Now, of course, those carcinogens are then released into the air and um, diffused, if you will. So the person that then breathes it in isn't getting it as intensely, but there's still a lot of bad there. Third hand smoke is um, what's, this is the concern in hospitals. And this is why um, places like UAB have said you cannot work here if you smoke cigarettes. And that is if you go out and smoke a cigarette and you put your hands on that cigarette, you then have carcinogens on your hands. You then come in and maybe change the sheets or hold a baby or help people who are very sick. And the carcinogens from your hands, from your clothing, 
then gets on their things and actually gets to them. And they actually see that people who are cared for by smokers have poorer health outcomes than people who are cared for by non-smokers, which again shows us that those carcinogens are passed on from one person to the next. And that's our third hand smoke that we now are you know, aware of and places like UAB Hospital are targeting. So while they do you know, drug tests for people who are going to work at the hospital, they now um, have banned tobacco use for new hires. I believe that if you are an old hire, they're not getting rid of you. But the idea is that if you are a new hire, you are not allowed to be a tobacco user. A lot of companies are also saying that you can't be a tobacco user and work at their company, partially for insurance reasons. And so a lot of things are financially motivated. Okay, went off a little bit on that, but I think it's all really good information. Okay, lawsuits seeking compensation for the health consequences of smoking were unsuccessful for many, many years. And then there were a lot of victories. In 1998, the settlement between 46 states and major tobacco companies, $205 billion in payments to the states. They were given advertising regulations and enforcement of laws prohibiting sales to minors. There are a lot of advertisements that clearly target minors because once you get somebody hooked, they are often a tobacco user for life. And also a problem with tobacco sales is that you're killing the people that you want to sell to. So as your, um, as your clients, as your customers die off because of your product, you need to keep having new, new, new people that are gonna be lifetime customers, okay? Um, Going back to the 205 billion, this is always so interesting to me because the tobacco companies are still doing really well financially. So that means they were able to give out payments of $205 billion. And I know it doesn't happen all at once, but $205 billion and they're still doing fine. Amazing. That's how much money is involved in these companies. Possible reasons for legal victories, just the changing legal climate, um, revelation of tobacco companies' actions in hiding information on adverse effects of smoking. So people knew that there were adverse effects, and the argument was always, well, you know, we've told you the truth, it's your decision, you know, that kind of thing. And people want to make their own decisions. But when people found out that these guys were hiding information and actually stating that they just think everybody is stupid and isn't going to figure it out. That made people mad, 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 mad. And then some things changed there. So interestingly, um, my husband works in the Department of Public Health, and he does research on ways to get people to quit smoking. It's called smoking cessation. And he's been doing this for a long time. Um, the majority of his grant funding comes from smoking cessation grants. What's interesting is that his father, um, who is no longer alive, but his father in his um, prime time as a lawyer actually represented tobacco companies. Um, so this is what I find interesting, right? His, his father made his money representing tobacco companies, and my husband's job is to get people to quit smoking. Okay, um, so looking for safer cigarettes, lower levels of nicotine. This is what I said, is that people tend to just adjust their smoking behavior to obtain a consistent amount of nicotine. They take more puffs, they inhale more deeply. Lower levels of tar. Tar is that nasty, sticky brown material that you've seen on a filter. You're putting that in your body. Um, based on changes in smoking behavior, there may be no advantage to switching to a low tar, low nicotine cigarette. So what the heck does safer mean? Going back to tar, 
Um, if you've ever been in someone's home who smokes in their house, you may see black, brown stains on the walls. That's tar. Um, that's going into people's lungs. So current cigarette use. About men, about 25%. Women, about 20%. Education is the single biggest influence on smoking rates. Percentage of smokers by education. We have high school diploma only, about 28%. Undergraduate, about 11%. Full-time college student, about 5%. And a non-college student is about 19%. In the 1970s, um, the use increased as smokers looked for alternative uh, with lower risk of lung cancer. This is smokeless tobacco. Okay, so now we're talking about you know our snuff or our um, chewing tobacco. The idea was, well, hopefully this will have a lower risk of lung cancer. Um, with snuff, like Skoll or Copenhagen, nicotine is absorbed through mucous membranes. The advantages over cigarettes, it's unlikely to cause lung cancer. It's less expensive, more socially acceptable in some circumstances. However, the packages do carry warning labels. Increased risk of dental disease, oral cancers, contains potent carcinogens. Um, it can have some very, very negative health consequences also. And of course, it does lead to nicotine dependence. In recent years, cigar smoking has actually increased. In 2008, about 9% of males and 2% of females reporting, reported smoking a cigar in the past month. These are pictures of hookahs. If you're not familiar with a hookah, a hookah is going to be, well, I'll say this, it's a large ornate water pipe, right? So you're gonna put water in the bottom of it, you put your flavored tobacco at the top, and you, you burn it from, from the top, and it goes through the pipe, through those, um, I guess, long pipes that have little mouthpieces on them. Some hookahs have several different mouthpieces, and then you would smoke through there. Hookahs produce a milder, watered, filtered tobacco smoke. The prevalence of hookah smoking is really unclear. Hookah bars have become very popular lately. Um, we have, you know, several of them here in Birmingham. And the idea, of course, is that you can go smoke at a hookah bar at age, well, I guess it must be 19 here. It's 18 in a lot of places. So instead of going to, you know, your bar where you're drinking alcohol, you go and you sit with your friends and you smoke a hookah. Major diseases linked to smoking, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, like emphysema. Increased risk for people who start young, who smoke a lot, who continue to smoke for a long time. Smoking is the number one single greatest avoidable cause of death. Number one. Side note, obesity is getting close, but smoking is still the single greatest avoidable cause of death. Okay, cigarette packages and advertisements are required to rotate um, among different warning labels. Secondhand smoke, right? Cigarette smoke inhaled from the environment by non-smokers. Mainstream smoke is the smoke inhaled and exhaled by the smoker. The side stream smoke is the smoke rising from the ash of a cigarette. More carcinogens are in that smoke, but the smoke is more diluted. And that's what I said already. Um, health effects are difficult to fully determine, but do include lung cancer, cardiovascular disease. We see these things much higher in um, well, adults that grew up in homes where their parents smoked. 1933, the Environmental Protection Agency classified secondhand smoke as a known human carcinogen. Many recent laws and regulations have been passed to protect non-smokers. Five million deaths worldwide each year. Five million. Estimates are 
you know, as high as 8 million by 2030 if we don't do something about this. The demand for American cigarettes in Asia has actually increased markedly. So worldwide, this is still a huge problem. And in third world countries, cigarettes are being marketed more and more. Smoking in pregnancy. You should not be smoking when you're pregnant, FYI. Um, increased risk of miscarriage, increased risk of low birth weight, increased risk of sudden infant death syndrome. Sudden infant death, death syndrome, SIDS, there's so much information out there now to try to prevent these kinds of things. You know, don't put your baby on its tummy to sleep. Don't put blankets in there. Don't put a bumper. Don't put a, I mean, like, you know, and everybody has different opinions and thoughts about these things. But when you look at the research, homes where someone smokes in the home have significantly, I mean significantly, higher rates of SIDS than homes where people do not smoke in the house. When you take out smoking, the rate of SIDS is very minimal. Several studies indicate the effects of, of physiological and cognitive development. So this is longer term with children whose parents, mothers, not parents, mothers smoked or birth mothers smoked during pregnancy. You see neurological problems, problems with reading and math skills, hyperactivity. Nicotine is the active ingredient in tobacco. It is a naturally occurring liquid alkaloid. It's colorless. It's volatile. Tolerance and dependence develop very quickly. It is highly toxic in large enough doses. The lethal dose is about 60 milligrams. A cigar contains twice the lethal dose. However, you're not eating a cigar. Don't eat a cigar. Uh, in, case, in case that's something that has crossed your mind, um, it's typically not delivered fast enough or high enough to be a lethal dose, right? But just FYI, not good. Okay. Inhalation is really effective. So 90% of the inhaled nicotine is absorbed. 80 to 90% of nicotine is deactivated in the liver and then excreted via the kidneys. Use of nicotine increases the activity of liver enzymes responsible for nicotine deactivation. Now this then contributes to tolerance, right? Your body gets used to this. This is now how it functions and then it needs more and more and needs you to continue. Um, it also may decrease the effects of other medications. Mechanisms of action. So nicotine mimics acetylcholine. So it first stimulates and then blocks the receptor sites. It also causes the release of adrenaline, and it has that indirect sympathomimetic effect. So it has that sort of Sympathetic nervous system arousal, however, interestingly, it also makes people feel calm and collected. And this is actually why we call this biphasic. Um, I don't want that. Hold on. So while this is not in here, do write this down. Biphasic. It's B-I slash phasic. P-H-A-S-I-C. Is that how you spell phasic? I don't know. So biphasic effects mean that you have your um, stimulant and depressant effects within the same drug. This is one of our few things that has that biphasic effects. Okay, symptoms of nicotine poisoning, low levels, nausea, dizziness, general weakness, often experienced by beginning smokers. Acute poisoning, tremors, convulsions, paralysis of breathing, death. Pretty darn rare. However, it's possible. So, central nervous system and circulatory system effects. You have your increased heart rate and blood pressure, increased oxygen need of the heart, decreased oxygen carrying ability, um, shortness of breath, increased tendency to clot. Often um, physicians will not give people birth control if they're also smokers, although some will. But your likelihood of having a blood clot while using birth control is significantly higher 
if you are smoking cigarettes. Okay. Um, which doesn't mean stop, you know, if it, it, it means stop smoking, increased electrical activity in the cortex, reduced hunger. So inhibition of hunger contractions, increased blood sugar, deadening of the taste buds. Nicotine is the primary reinforcing substance in tobacco. Nicotine has both stimulant and calming effects by phasic. User expectation, environmental setting, and genetics do play a role in the effects. The tobacco industry claims that its products do not cause dependence. They still say this, oh my gosh. Conclusions made in the Surgeon General's report in 1988. Cigarettes and other forms of tobacco are addicting. Nicotine is the drug in tobacco that causes addiction. The processes that determine tobacco and addiction are similar to those that determine addiction to drugs like heroin and cocaine. How to stop. There are more than 40 million ex-smokers. 90% actually have no formal treatment programs. So um, a lot of the formal treatment programs are just not good enough, which is again why people like my husband are working a lot harder to try to come up with something better. There are a lot of challenges to quitting. Nicotine is a strongly reinforcing drug. And a pack a day smoker gets about 50,000 reinforcing nicotine puffs per year. Nicotine replacement therapy. So you have your patches, your lozenges, your nasal spray, your inhalers, your gum, all these things work. And you can use more than one at a time if needed. These things deliver nicotine without the tar, without carbon monoxide. Some people use a pharmacological therapy like Zyban. Zyban is bupropion. Bupropion is actually an antidepressant. However, it is given a new name. It's the exact same drug, but it's given a new name, Zyban, and then given to people for this. And it seems to work somewhat well. Okay, It works for a lot of people. Combining counseling and pharmacological treatments dramatically increase the odds of quitting. Um, one more thing I want to talk about here is e-cigarettes. So e-cigarettes are not regulated by the FDA. So the FDA regulates nicotine replacement therapies. It regulates a lot of things. Actually, not until recently did the FDA regulate tobacco, not uh, during Obama's time. You know, they started regulating tobacco. So they do not regulate e-cigarettes. So this makes it unknown as to what you're getting. I can't say at this point that e-cigarettes are better or worse for you than regular cigarettes. It may be a good way to quit. It may be something that you think is fun and cool and looks neat and you can get pretty colors of um you know, products. But the thing is, they're still dangerous and you don't actually know what you're getting because they're not regulated by anyone. Having said that, over the next several years, we're going to have more and more research on this. Um, this is another area that my husband is, is working on researching are the e-cigarettes, um, seeing what's going on with that, what's positive, what's negative. Um, a lot of people are doing some research into this because it is so new. There's a huge market for it. A lot of money is being made off of it. So that's that. I'm going to leave you with that. I could talk on and on about this, I promise, but I won't. I will see you in the next chapter.